Well, let's start out. Let's start out chapter six, in the book of Isaiah. We we'll start with verse one. I'll be reading from the New King James this morning. And the word reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and they hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. And then I said, How long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitants. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be in stone. All right, we start out in verse 1. We're going to go through this like we had the last couple of weeks. The word starts out in just a first few words. says, in the year King Uzziah died. Now, church history shows us that this took place around 740 B.C. Uzziah, also known as Azariah, was made king of Judah in 792 after his father had been assassinated. Uzziah was known to be a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord prospered him greatly. Yet in the later years of his reign, he became proud of his accomplishments. He became proud of his, his military conquests. He became proud of his, of his building expansions, and he determined that he himself was worthy to offer up burnt incense to the Lord in the temple. And this was a responsibility which the Lord had assigned only to the Levite priests. And yet Uzziah determined that he himself should go and do this. Now when the priest attempted to stop Uzziah from burning the incense, the word says that he became furious. And that while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord. You can read the, the events of the, of the life of Uriah in 2 Chronicles in chapter 26 and in 2 Kings chapter 15. But after this specific event took place, Uzziah lived the rest of his life in seclusion as a leper, and his son, Jotham, ruled in his place. Uzziah came before the Lord with such pride, and he refused to listen to those who the, the Lord God Almighty had placed in the temple and transgressed, transgressed mightily before the Lord. Now again, going back to the word, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah writes, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
And what again, what I'm reading is the New King James. In the King James, the scripture reads, I saw also the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. Now this would imply to me that Isaiah saw a king upon a throne, but he saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. And his throne was one that was high and lifted up. For the throne upon, upon which our God is seated, our God who is the Lord God Almighty, his throne cannot be contained in this world. And thus his throne is high and it is lifted up. His throne is exalted and he is seated above all other kings. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Now we know of a robe as, a, as an outer garment with which one wraps himself. And the train of a garment is that length of the garment which trails along behind the one who wears it. I don't believe that Isaiah was referring to these tremendous lengths of folded material that were so vast that the fabric filled the temple of God. For church, God's not cloaked in polyester or rayon or cotton. Our God is cloaked with splendor. Our God is cloaked with glory. He's cloaked in holiness and in righteousness. And this was the train of his robe which filled the temple. And remember, it's his temple. Isaiah wasn't referring to the temple in Jerusalem, but to God's temple, to his holy throne room, and it was filled with his glory. It was filled with his splendor, his unmatched holiness. And that's what filled the temple of God. That's what surrounds the presence of God. In church, nothing has changed since 940 B.C. God's presence is still such today. When we enter into his presence, understand that we're surrounded by his glory. We're surrounded by his splendor, his righteousness, and his unmatched holiness. You know, all too often I hear people speak of God's presence as if it is some trivial matter. As if, as if his presence is little more than an aroma given off by a fragrant candle. Yet you know, when you read the word of God throughout the word, it says whenever man enters into his presence, he falls to his knees. Whenever a man enters into the presence of God in the word, he falls upon his face. He pays homage to this one who is the great I am. He acts out of reverence, with fear and trembling. And even here, further down, we will read how how Isaiah responded to what he has seen. We here in the church today, we have a great deal that we can learn about entering into God's presence from the examples of men of God in the Word. But for now, continuing on here, the Word says, I saw the Lord seating on a throne high and lifted up in the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim, each had, had six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now these seraphim to which Isaiah speaks, to which he refers to, they're not listed anywhere else in Scripture. This is our only reference. These are not the cherubim, which we read about in other places. This is the only reference, and it is our only description of these creatures who stand above God's throne. The descriptive noun, seraphim, is believed to have derived from the Hebrew word seraph, which means to burn with fire. And this is likely due to their appearance, as though they glowed like burning fire and it's holy fire they were standing in the glory of god the word tells us they had six wings six wings each and the two that covered their face for church they stand in the very presence of god and thus they cover their face humbly before the living god of israel and with two wings they cover their feet for they stand in his presence they stand upon that which is holy they stand where others kneel. 
They stand where others are prostrate. They stand where others bow, yet they stand humbly with their feet covered. And with two wings they fly, church, and they fly over the presence of our God most high. And one cried to another, and he said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Whenever a word is repeated in Scripture, it takes on special significance. And when it's repeated a third time, it is a direct, a direct declaration of extreme relevance, of extreme significance. The seraphim, they were making a declaration before all of heaven, before all of creation of the holiness of our God. For there is none other of whom there is such a declaration in all of Scripture except our God. For he alone is holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is full of his glory. In the original Hebrew, Hebrew, the word order reads, the fullness of all the earth is his glory. Church, there is none other who has the glory like our God. Verse 4, the word reads, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah was looking upon the throne and upon the train of God's glory filling his temple. He was looking at the seraphim above the throne, and he heard the voice of one who cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In church, the doorposts of the temple of God shook because of the voice of this one crying out. If this declaration of God's holiness could shake the very doorposts of the temple of God, how much more should we be moved by the knowledge, by the remembrance of such? How much more should the whole world shake by his very visitation, by the nearness of his presence? And the house was filled with smoke, church, just as the tabernacle of Moses had been with God's presence, just as Solomon's temple had been with God's presence, and just as Mount Sinai had been covered by God's presence, the temple was filled with the cloud of smoke, the cloud of God's glory. So I said, verse 8, so I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah understood his unworthiness. The word here, unclean, in the original Hebrew, it refers to being polluted. It refers to being contaminated. This word isn't referring to something that's got a little bit of dirt smeared on it, but to something that is putrid, to something that is foul. Here Isaiah is saying, I am foul. I am a stench. Here is Isaiah standing. He's gazing up into the throne room. He's gazing up into the holiness of God. And here he recognizes his own lack of holiness. He comes to grip with his sinfulness here in God's presence. There's much for us to learn from this church. We come into a, a sanctuary on Sunday morning and on, on Wednesday evenings with the expectation of God showing up and moving. And yet God, I'm telling you, God is saying to us today, leave your sinful stench outside the doors of the sanctuary. Don't bring it in here into my house. Isaiah comes to grips with his in God's presence and he cries out, woe is me for I am undone. I would imagine he cries out in fear because he is unclean. And clean is the same word that used of God to describe those who had touched a dead animal's carcass. It's the same word that God uses to describe those who have broken out in leprosy. It's the same word that God uses for those who, do, who were to be cast out of the community of God's people. And now here he is, Isaiah, in God's presence, unclean, 
defiled and unworthy of God's notice. Here he is among heavenly beings who are praising our God and his holiness while Isaiah stands quiet. Here he is, he is a representative of a people whose sin is an offense before their God, whose sin is a foul stench in his nostril. He recognizes his own mortality before God and he proclaims the state when he declares, I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Church, again, we have much, much to learn from circumstances just such as this. Because I declare to you today that we are a people of unclean lips and we live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah understood he was a sinner, a sinner who was standing in the very presence of a holy God. We come and gather together in church and we cry out for God just to manifest your presence here. Before we do so, we need to look into our own hearts and ask ourselves, really, we want to be in God's presence. We have not been. Isaiah understood. And his plight was the plight of every man, of every unrepentant sinner who suddenly and without warning finds himself in God's presence. On Sunday mornings, we at least, we understand we are seeking to come into God's presence. We at the very least, we have the opportunity to repent of our sin, to ask forgiveness before we join together in worship and seek him. You know, when I've traveled for work and, and I've had the opportunity to visit churches around the southeast states of our nation, I've often I've just been surprised at the number of churches that I've been in where there is absolutely no life. There's no life there. They're dead churches. They're filled with spiritually dead individuals. They're believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in the Lord God Most High. They believe that the Word is holy. And nonetheless, there's no visible evidence of God's Spirit dwelling within. They gather together on Sunday and they gather together on Wednesday to merely go through the motions of doing church. And as I, as I began to prepare this message, I believe God revealed to me the churches have no life because he simply is not present. In those fellowships, there may be no remorse. There may be no repentance of sin and God simply chooses not to fellowship there. If we are or to maintain the living church with the spirit of the living God who dwells among his people, then we must be a repentant church. We must be a church choosing to recognize the holiness of our God. We need to be a fellowship of humble people who understand God's spirit does not have to abide with us. There is no holy requirement written by God that says he must be here. When God's spirit is present, is because of his choosing. Isaiah understood who he was and, and he understood where he was and he cried out before God. He said, I am undone. He expressed remorse and God responded. In verse 8, the word says that when then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my lips with it and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. As I read this, I thought it interesting that the, the seraphim held a live coal in his hand. And yet when he removed it from the altar, he used tongs. Now, if you can hold it in your hand, why would you use the tongs to remove it from the altar? Why not just reach out there and pick up this coal? But it could it be, church, that this altar is God's altar? 
And could it be that this altar in God's temple does not represent the altar upon which men have sacrificed the lives of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals for the forgiveness of their sins? You know, we know as an altar, it represents sacrifice, but church just maybe, maybe being that it was God's altar, maybe it represented his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And not those of men. And just maybe the seraphim did not have the authority to touch that which would represent the sacrifice of God. For God would give his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. And so the seraphim used his tongues to access the pole, which he then carried in his hands to touch Isaiah's lips and cleanse them of his sin. Church, it was, it was a holy fire carried by a holy being from a holy altar, possibly one representing God's holy sacrifice for man. And this holy fire was then used to cleanse Isaiah from his sin. And it was a cleansing that was freely given without cost, without recompense. Hmm. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. The original Hebrew word translated to purged means covered. And it is the same word which has been translated as atonement. Isaiah's sin had been covered and atoned for a holy fire from an altar which I believe represents God's sacrifice. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the speak. Talk about the setup, church. God provides Isaiah with a vision of his holy throne room. He reveals himself to Isaiah in his glory and in his splendor. He reveals to Isaiah his temple, his, his throne room. He introduces Isaiah to the holy seraphim. He shows them the, the temple altar and, and has the seraphim use holy fire from the altar to proclaim Isaiah's cleansing, his purification, his forgiveness from sin. A forgiveness which again is freely given without cost. And then says aloud for Isaiah to hear, hmm, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Did he really think Isaiah would say, Not me? I ain't gonna go. Sorry, can't do it. Not a chance. God knew exactly what he was doing when he called Isaiah. He knew who he was calling, just as he does when he issues his calling to us today. And he knew Isaiah, and he created him. And he knew what he would need to do to convince Isaiah to serve. Personally, I think Isaiah might possibly have been a very stubborn man whom God knew would need more than just a little convincing. Thus we have this account of Isaiah's calling by God. How could Isaiah have possibly turned down God's request after all the Lord had exposed him to? I remember one of the first times I read this account of Isaiah's calling, and I originally originally thought Isaiah was such a fortunate man for God to have given him such a glimpse of glory. <laughs> A glimpse that, that, that few others in all of history would ever experience. But I'm not so sure of that. But you see, God's calling on Isaiah's life was not going to be a very pleasant experience. God would send him out with a harsh message for the people of Judah. Listen to the words of these remaining verses. 
And he said, go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. And Isaiah says, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return, and be for consuming. As a terebinth tree, or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. At the end there, the Lord is telling Isaiah, he's, he's revealing the promise that there will be a remnant, and that there will be a holy seed in the land. There's all that before it. Our God knew Isaiah's assignment would be difficult. He knew it would be harsh. And he knew Isaiah would likely need something more than just a small, still, quiet voice. And God gave Isaiah a view of glory that he would take with him wherever he would need to travel. It was a view he would never forget. A view which would inspire him even on the darkest of days. The one that would compel him to speak and to record the words given to him through the Holy Spirit. Isaiah would ever remember the holy nature of his God. And, and in his writings, he referred to God as the Holy One of Israel 30 different times. In all of Scripture, I checked last time, I believe there was only three other references to God as the Holy One of Israel. But Isaiah knew it. It was, it was imprinted in his mind. He had seen the holy nature of God. The church Isaiah lived in a land and among a people who had turned their back on God. They had forgotten how God had blessed them throughout their history. They had become a very successful and a wealthy and a very self-sufficient people. They had cast God aside and they had begun to worship idols rather than their God. They even went so far as to sacrifice their own children to the idols. And then they, they began to suffer defeats in battles that they engaged in. And even their allies, who they gave great wealth to, would not come to their age. To their, sorry, to their aid. And apostasy filled the land. The temple doors were shut. And the articles from the house of God were destroyed. And yet God still would call a man of faith and give him an incredible insight into glory. And then he would send him to the people of God, to their, to their kings, and, and call them to repent and to turn back to the Holy One of Israel. In the later part of his ministry, Isaiah's ministry, Hezekiah would sit upon the throne of Judah. And he was a righteous king who would do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was a king who would follow after the ways of King David and who would restore temple worship and cleanse the land of idols. A period of revival would come upon the land and the people would prosper. God called Isaiah and gave him what he needed to fulfill his calling. God has called us as well, church. He will give each of us what we will need to go forth to fulfill what he has assigned us to do. There's been no visions of glory yet. Well, they may still come, but understand when they do, and if they do, that you are likely in store for a setup. And don't think too highly of yourself, or, or even when the vision comes, keep in mind that those who are hard headed and stubborn might likely be shown more than those who would willingly chase after the God and his promise. We live in a land much like Israel at that time. We go about our, our, our days and as we, we go about our travels and, and as we come across people in our pathway, we need to be ever mindful. God, what would you have me speak to these people today? What would you have me say to, to the clerk? 
We meet people every single day in our travels who don't know God. Who have no understanding of this altar in the temple representing God's sacrifice for us. All of you, please remember, if we are to be a living and a vibrant church, we must first be a humble and repent. We need to cleanse and purify ourselves. Not once a week. Every day, it's a daily process. We need to lift up our shortcomings before the Lord. Gosh, I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, for your sin. Give me, Lord, that, that I have forgotten that you have blessed me, blessed my family, blessed our nation, blessed this church. If we expect God to manifest his glory here among us, we must be clean and purified people. I gotta tell you, I for one, I want to pass on this one. I want to lean in. I want to fulfill the calling that he's laid upon my life. Like I say, I've said, here am I, Lord, send me. I want to hear those, those words one day at the end of days, well done, good and faithful servant. Now come and enter into your next day. Church, as you go about your week, remember your calling. Look around you at the nation that the that we reside in. Look at the similarities between us and the fallen nation of Israel. Know and understand that we have a purpose and a calling. There's a need in this nation for us to be what God's calling us to be.